uh, you are the oh, I got it. There's a message. <laughs> yeah, so we are not uh, doing that, uh, uh, you know, uh, behind your back. <laughs> it's very, very public. So it, it's, it's safe to switch off microphones. <laughs> yes, unless you are the speaker. <laughs> Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, uh, today, the speaker of this week's virtual meetup will be Michael Valentine, and the talk will be about bringing together workbenches, language workbenches, and microsystems. Uh, Michael is a PhD student uh, at Northeastern University. He works uh, making Racket a better host for domain specific languages. And he previously contributed to turnstile type system meta language and to the mini candle logic programming language. So I will uh, leave the floor to Michael. Thank you for uh, accepting our invite invitation and uh, a good presentation. All right, thank you. Um, oh, somebody has to let me share my screen so that you can see anything. Otherwise I get to extemporaneously speak. <laughs> yes, uh, now you should be able to, sorry. All right, no worries. So I'll have some slides and then I'm gonna give you a little demo of the system that I've been working on. Um, and please feel free to interrupt me if anything doesn't make sense or to ask any questions. Uh, definitely be happy to have it be a discussion instead of just me talking. Um, right, so I work on the Racket programming language um, uh, with the, the group that created it. And um, I work on making its macro system better. And one of the big ideas in Racket is language-oriented programming, which I assume this audience is probably pretty familiar with. But um, I do want to sort of uh, clarify sort of our twist on, on what we're trying to do. Um, so I'm going to do that with a little example program that um, uses language-oriented programming, perhaps to an excessive degree, but uh, it's illustrative, I think. So um, this is a little program. The goal is to uh, just tweak some files that are in a directory on your computer. You have a bunch of JSON files that look like these ones here. Um, they, you know, dictionaries, they all have results, they all have a list of one thing, and you just want to modify them to just have the single element from the list. So what's a really concise way of doing that? Um, so if we're going to do this in Racket, uh, one way to do it would be to use a number of languages together. So sort of the main language of this file is the Rash shell scripting language. Um, that's an extension of Racket that uh, makes it work like a shell. Um, so at the bottom, we have something that looks like a line from a shell script using the Unix find command to go look through a directory and find all the JSON files in it. Um, and then for each uh, line that results from that find command, we are going to pipe that file name uh, into the fix file function that we've written in Racket code. Um, so the Racket code is going to read the file, it's going to manipulate it somehow, it's going to write it back out. Um, and because what we're doing is, uh, you know, basically manipulating a, a structured tree, uh, it makes sense to do that using a pattern matching construct. So we use Racket's match form. And match, like most of the interesting syntaxes in Racket, is not part of sort of the core language that the base Racket compiler knows anything about. It's implemented as a fairly sophisticated macro on top of Racket. Um, and that macro builds in all sorts of, uh, you know, many of the optimization algorithms that you would often find in a match implementation in something like OCaml. So it's not less sophisticated for not being built in. Um, but we're going to use that to pattern match on the JSON and uh, reconstruct the output. Um, but match doesn't know about JSON. JSON isn't something that's built into pattern matching either. Um, so there's yet another level here where um, the, the JSON pattern uh, is actually an extension to the match language that is defined by a JSON library that defines a match expander. Um, that says how to interpret that JSON pattern as a more primitive kind of match pattern. 
And it turns out that the uh, each line construct in find, right, in the find command at the bottom in Rash, that's actually also a macro on top of something more primitive in Rash. Um, so that's, I don't remember exactly, it's been a while since I wrote this code, but that's on top of probably a for loop construct in uh, the shell scripting language. So overall we're using, let me see, we're using sort of these towers of languages where we have Racket at the base, we have these DSLs that extend Racket in different ways, and then we can even build abstractions on top of those DSLs, um, building either higher level DSLs, or in this case, just sort of smaller extensions that integrate with those. Um, so I guess this is the theme of how we think about programming with DSL in Racket. And I think it's, you know, uh, I, I don't know a whole lot about uh, the way all of you work with DSLs, um, but it's certainly different than, um, you know, some of the applications that I'm familiar with of, you know, we're not focusing on um, sort of end users programming. This is all for uh, sort of normal software engineers, uh, but trying to bring their programming to a higher level of abstraction. And in particular, trying to make it really frictionless to use DSLs, right? You know, I'm going along writing this program and I realize that I can use match, I can use rash, I just have to import those things. I don't have to go set up a tool or a build system or anything like that to be able to, to leverage um, these DSLs. So that's the general picture of what we try and do. Um, so this talk, uh, I want to give you a little bit of that picture about what we love about macros, um, but also tell you about some of the places where uh, it is becomes difficult to make really sophisticated languages with macros. And particularly when you, uh, when you stop trying to reuse parts of the host uh, language, and instead you're trying to build something custom um, that is rather different from the host language, then those kinds of macros just turn into, you know, you write a big compiler as a single macro, and it might be a really complex piece of code that doesn't have very much structure and is forced to use the host macro system API that is very complex. Um, so those bigger kinds of macros are something that are a real challenge to write. Um, and sort of the idea that I've been working on recently is, well, maybe we can bring in the meta languages that have been built in language workbenches and build something analogous on top of the macro system and uh, thereby sort of get the advantages that we loved about macros that uh, at least from my perspective are missing when I've used other language workbenches. Uh, while at the same time getting, getting, advantage, getting the advantage of the sort of declarative uh, structured language definition that you get out of working with language workbench. Um, so I'm going to give you a little demo of the system like that. Um, and the other exciting thing, at uh, this is more speculative, and you can argue with me at the end whether it's actually plausible, um, is that this idea of building a language workbench sort of as a library on top of a macro system might be a way of um, bringing language workbench technologies sort of to mainstream programmers in mainstream languages. Um, because if a language workbench is just like a DSL and Racket, something that they can just import as a library, start using without having any friction of switching to a whole new system, uh, then maybe that'll be something that's easier for people to adopt. Um, than switching their whole workflow. So that's a little more speculative. So far, we've just built this on Racket, but we think we could build something similar on other languages that have macro systems. So on top of Rust or on top of Julia, um, mainstream languages that have macro systems might be able to host something like this. So uh, to start with, I just want to give you a little demo, a little reminder of uh, the way we build uh, little language extensions and what we love about that in Racket. This will just be a short little piece, and then we'll get on to the, the new pieces that I've been working on. <clears throat> Let's see, this one. All right, make this a little bigger, maybe. So uh, here's a little function. Um, and I guess, suppose I should write a little signature at the top so that it's clear what it takes. Um, so it's a function that's going to take uh, something that is a either a string or a symbol. Oops. 
and it's going to take a string and it's going to return either a string or a symbol, depending on what came in. Um, and the whole point of the function is you just want to manipulate uh, this name and you want to add some prefix onto it. Um, so um, it ends up having a couple of patterns that if you write a lot of racket code, um, you'll, you'll start encountering a lot. Um, and you start to look at it and say, oh, well, I really wish that I could write this function somewhat differently. So one pattern that comes up a lot is you have a, a conditional expression, a cond. And uh, for anyone not familiar with the syntax of cond, um, you have cond clauses. And for each clause, you have the condition. And then you have the consequent. Um, what to do if that condition is true. And it's very common that you end up writing a cond expression. Um, that uh, has a bunch of predicates all applied to the same thing, the same argument to the function. Um, and so you start saying, oh, well, I really wish I could actually write this differently. So I really wish I could write something like a switch uh, where I just write the conditional, the predicate, so that I don't keep repeating the application to the name. Um, really just a small syntactic pattern. Uh, but something that chief chafes after you've done this a dozen times. Um, and so in Racket, we can do that because we can really easily create this extension to the language that compiles switch to cont. Um, so I'm just going to do that here. Um, so define syntax rule is the way we're going to introduce uh, a macro like that. Um, and this is a really high level way of defining macros. Uh, there are lower level ways, um, but I'll start with this one. So we start by writing the pattern of the syntax that we want to match. So switch with some expression, some uh, predicate, and some body. And the predicate and the body part, uh, the clause is sort of repeated for however many clauses there are. Um, and then we'll just compile that to the cond expression. So cond, the guard, which is formed by applying the predicate to the expression, uh, and the body and repeat that. Now, there's one little problem with this implementation of the macro is that we're duplicating this expression. Uh, and that'll mean that we end up repeating the side effect. So we actually write it just ever so slightly differently. We will generate a let binding of a value for the result of the expression. And then we'll use that instead uh, in the guards. <clears throat> So that's all that we need to do to implement this new version of uh, this, this switch so that we can implement this new version of the function. So I can test this out. Um, and it works. So that's sort of the first thing that we might notice here. Um, and then another thing that we might notice is that uh, we have this particular structure that you often see in code, where you're going to start with something that's an argument, and you're going to make a sequence of transformations on it, right? So we're going to do symbol to string on that thing, then we're going to append something onto the front, and then we're going to go back from a string back to a symbol. Um, so you might prefer to be able to write this in a different way that sort of makes that sequencing really clear. You might prefer to write, so start with the name then apply symbol to string to it, then apply string append with the prefix, and implicitly the argument's going to come in the last position here when we give a partial application like this. And then finally, we're going to apply string to symbol to the result of that. Um, and this is the way that we might want to write that instead. So the third version of our function. Um, so I'm not going to write this particular macro in this case, but I'm going to import it from a library. Uh, this is something that was popular in Clojure, and people have ported over to Racket in a library called Threading. So I can just import that, and I have a new version uh, that uses that new syntax that I have decided that I like. And that works too. So uh, this is actually the story of somebody who made a DSL called Chi, um, somebody I work with named Sid. 
And uh, they had found themselves that they made this uh, switch macro like this, and they had encountered the threading macro uh, in their programming, and they had started writing code in sort of this style um, that's sort of like point-free programming, uh, if you're familiar with that from, from Haskell, where a lot of what you're writing down is functions without writing down what they're applied to. What they're applied to is sort of implicit from the context. Uh, a value that's sort of being threaded through starting from name here. So we're writing down these predicates as, um, as these functions that take an argument implicitly. We're writing down the transformation on the name as these functions that implicitly take an argument. So uh, Sid thought that, how about we make that a whole style of programming and build a DSL around that? So he made uh, this DSL called G. So I'll show you how that looks. Um, so I'm gonna have to write this in a submodule just because the names conflict. Um, but uh, so I'm gonna import G um, and make another version of this thing. So Chi takes this idea sort of to the next level, and it says that, well, each of these contexts, like when we're in a switch form that's going to be part of Chi, each of the contexts is going to expect a flow. So instead of writing that we're going to start this thread starting from the name, we're going to implicitly start from the same thing that the conditions were based on in the switch. Um, and similarly, what's coming into here is again going to be the name. So we're just going to write this as a flow, as one of these things that implicitly takes an argument, and we can just write it this way. Um, so we can make it even more concise. So this is my fourth version of add prefix. <clears throat> I got it right. Yep, seems to work. So I think what's interesting here is, first of all, um, how easy it is to either uh, create a little language extension or to import a library that has language extensions very fluidly while you're programming. And the other interesting thing is that um, as you start to notice patterns in your code, syntactic patterns, things that in some languages might be design patterns even at larger scale, um, you notice those things and those become opportunities to create languages, opportunities to very easily create a little abstraction over that design pattern and turn it into a language feature instead. And, you know, those might start out as these really small extensions, things like switch or things like threading. Um, but as you notice sort of the pattern in the patterns that you're extracting, you notice that, hey, all of these things are about this concept of a flow um, and point free programming. Okay, well, now I can actually turn those ideas into a cohesive language um, that integrates all those different forms that I've discovered. Um, whereas if I had started, you know, saying, oh, well, I'm going to create a language, uh, you may not have known that idea from the start. Um, all right. Mm -hmm. Uh, the slide just says what I <laughs> what I just said. Um, low friction, really easy to to work. You don't have to configure any tools, and you can you can discover languages. And the last thing that I'll mention here um, is that part of this works because we're reusing things from the host language. Um, so in particular, when I wrote down, um, let's see. I guess neither of those uh, extensions had binding forms, but if I if I were to create an extension that had uh, binding positions, right, um, the way that is understood is via hygienic expansion, ex via the binding structure of what it expands to. So I learn the scoping rules from the surface syntax of what I expand to. Um, so I'm sort of reusing things from the host. Uh, in a way that means that I don't have to write them down. I just write down the very simplest thing, which is the way that uh, my feature expands to the host. And other things like that you get, um, again, via like our, the IDE's understanding of your code comes from it. It's tracking the expansion uh, of what you write down to the target language, it's understanding of the target language, and then being able to provide you ID services on the host, or sorry, on the surface language based on what it expands to. 
So part of what makes this really lightweight is the way that you're sort of reusing um, the ecosystem's understanding of the host language that you're expanding to. Um, so those are the things that we really like about macros. Um, and uh, I guess next I want to talk about what happens when we sort of scale up uh, building macros to, to build, using macros to build uh, much more complex language features. So uh, here are just some examples of, of pretty sophisticated languages that are built using macros in Racket. One of them, I think you had a, a talk here at the community about before, uh, Syndicate. Um, so Syndicate's uh, a language for concurrency that has actors and data spaces. Uh, I'm not going to go into any of how that is, but you can see it, it, isn't, it isn't plain Racket at all. Um, so that language is built using macros on top of Racket. Racket has a very sophisticated sort of higher order class system with mixins and traits and all sorts of things. That is also not part of the core language or compiler at all. That's all built as macros on top of Racket. And you can uh, sort of morph the language totally beyond recognition. So Alexis King created Hackett, which is a Haskell-like language built using macros on top of Racket. Uh, it's lazy, it has types, it's pure. Um, and all of that was accomplished by writing macros that uh, expand a racket and use the, the macro system APIs. Um, so you can do really powerful things, um, but uh, sorry, you can do really powerful things. So um, when you're building languages like this um, that are increasingly different from racket, um, so, you know, the things that I live coded there were just little extensions on Racket, right? These are things that have very different semantics from Racket. And, you know, when we start looking at Hackett, right, um, it has a type system that's totally different. It has a grammar that separates types and terms and patterns that's totally different from Racket's grammar. Um, and it has sort of an optimizing backend that tries to make lazy evaluation a little bit more efficient on top of a VM that's not designed for lazy evaluation. So, um, so all these things, as we get to complex languages, instead of reusing pieces from Racket by expanding to it, we're starting to want to implement our own custom grammar, uh, static semantics, so that would be things like binding structure or type systems. Um, we're wanting to implement optimizing backends, which mean that it's not just a simple expansion from surface to target, but where we need to go through some intermediate representations and do sort of whole program transformations. So we want to do all these custom things, but at the same time, since we're working in this language-oriented programming context where we want all of these DSLs to fit inside the host language and interact together, um, we have to also make them integrate with the host language and provide the right information to the IDE um, so that we can get some IDE services out of it. Um, and doing all that work requires us to integrate. If we're, if we're building stuff custom, instead of reusing from Racket, we end up having to integrate with uh, a whole lot of APIs that are sort of at the implementation level of the host language in order to achieve that integration while building these things as custom as we want. Um, so as we scale up, we encounter problems. The class macro, just the macro itself, none of the runtime support, none of the helpers, it's 1400 lines of procedural racket code uh, and very few people can understand it. Um, it uses a big API with all sorts of concepts, definition context, local expansion, scope sets, phases and visits, free ID tables, just a whole lot of concepts that you have to become aware of to implement this kind of stuff. And I, you know, there's probably 20 people who can do this kind of stuff uh, and maybe five people who really deeply understand all of those things that are involved. Um, so uh, you can build compelling stuff, but it's pretty hard. So, um, yeah, here's the problem. You can start, we, we have a really good story starting from building sort of syntactic sugar, things like switch, things like thread. You can build things like Chi or Syndicate uh, without too much difficulty. So in terms of you can get a lot of uh, sophistication of the language you can build without sort of having to know a whole lot about the macro system. But as soon as you start doing stuff like class or match, where you have a custom grammar, you have an optimizing compiler, you really sort of uh, hit this cliff where you have to learn a whole lot about the macro system to, to be effective. And when you start wanting to build your own static semantics, like a type system, you have to know even more. And there are very few people who know how to do that. 
Um, so perhaps we can bring in some idea from language workbenches. Language workbenches uh, are all about letting you uh, define uh, custom grammars and static semantics and things like that by giving you uh, meta languages that let you express those concepts uh, succinctly and uh, sort of in a declarative way, instead of having to integrate at an implementation level um, via nasty API. So maybe we can build something like that on top of Racket. Um, so that's what I've done. Uh, and it helps you structure your language front end a bit, helps you hide the API. And our hope is this is not something that this is a little more speculative, not something that I've implemented so far. But uh, having that declarative specification of your language front end um, might also allow us to, like a language workbench does, generate much better IDE services than you get currently um, from language extensions in Racket. So things like auto completion that understand the binding structure, uh, sort of the 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 environment in which you're you're pressing tab and the grammar uh, and possibly the type system. Um, that's an example of an editor service that we really don't get in Racket right now. Um, other things like uh, being able to recover from errors so that we can give you more than one error message about why your program uh, is, is a, has a problem. Um, those would be things that we'd really like to do and macros have been sort of in the way, but maybe if we have more of a declarative specification of your language, we can do that. Um, so next piece, I'm going to give you a little demo of building uh, building DSL with the meta language I've been working on. All right, so um, wrong tab. Here we are. So I'm going to start just by showing you the context of where we want this. Um, so just a little toy, little GUI program. Uh, you put in a URL and it loads a table of CSV files, a uh, table from a CSV file from some URL. Um, and the thing to note here is that to implement this, this UI, it's sort of a state machine. There are different states it can be in. It can be in a state of displaying data that you've loaded. It could be in a state uh, where there was an error with the data that you've loaded. It could be uh, waiting for you to click load as you're editing the URL. Um, so these are the sort of different states that uh, this UI can be in. So if we look at the implementation of this UI, uh, there's a bunch of pieces that you have to be know that they're there, but I don't want to look at just the sort of definitions of the GUI elements using Racket's GUI system, um, a bunch of actions in the UI, um, a bunch of code to load the data from the CSV file from the URL. Uh, but then the piece that I want to focus on is sort of the controller for the user interface that implements effectively this state machine. So if I don't have a language to do this with, and but I have this idea that I want a state machine, um, how am I going to do this in sort of a conventional programming language? Well, I'm going to have to encode the control flow of the state machine in some way in the language that I do have. So if I was in an object-oriented language, maybe I would use classes and have a different class per state, implementing some interface for the state machine. Um, in Racket, sort of the most concise way to do this is to use um, basically functions that sort of act like objects, that construct, event, uh, construct functions that uh, handle events. So that's the pattern that I used here. So for each state, uh, so I have four states, one where we just started up, I don't have any data yet, one where I'm currently loading data from the server, but I don't have it back yet. One where uh, I'm displaying the data and one where uh, I found some error when I was trying to load the data. Those are sort of the four states that my UI can be in. And for each of those, um, I have a function that you basically call to enter that state. So when I enter the original state that has no data, I want to modify the UI to show the message saying, please type in a URL. Uh, and then the other thing that this function does is it returns an event handler that says, well, different kinds of events that can be triggered by the UI, how am I going to react to those? So uh, if somebody clicks the load button in the UI, well, I'm going to transition into the loading state. If somebody uh, types in something, edits the URL, then I'm going to come, you know, have a self edge back into this no data state just with an updated UI. 
So this is what I have to write if I don't have a DSL. Um, so I have these these different handlers for these different um, these different states. Um, and there's a lot of things that I can get wrong, mistakes that I can make there. So what I would really like to do is be able to write it in a DSL like this. Um, just reindent that. Let me. Uh, here we go. You can see the whole thing now. So in a DSL, I can declare my states, four of them. I can declare um, actions to take on entering the state. And I can declare transitions uh, where events happen and what other states I go to and what actions I take uh, when making that transition. And then I can also sort of, by having a DSL like this, I can factor out uh, some parts that are shared between all of the states. So in any uh, state that I'm in, if somebody clicks on the load button, I want to go to the loading state. Any state that I'm in, if they change the URL, I want to go back to the no data, no data state waiting for them to click the button. Um, so at least for me, this is a much nicer way of expressing that state machine. So uh, I want to show you how I can start building the syntax for this state machine uh, to make this sort of real code. So I'm going to put that in a file called state machine.rkt, and I'm going to require it here so that'll work. Um, and then Let's make a new editor and start writing. State. All right, so I'm going to import my my uh, my DSL, which is called binding spec. And then I'm going to start sort of uh, defining a grammar for the language for the language. So uh, there are a couple of different kinds of things. There are states. So I'm going to call that non-terminal in the grammar a state spec. There are um, event handlers. So I'm going to call that an uh, I'm going to call that an event spec. Um, and then sort of at the top level of the language, there's also the, the machine uh, language construct. And this one's a little bit different because this is, um, this is the place where we interact with normal racket code. So this isn't sort of internal to the language. It's at the interface between racket and the DSL. So I define this one a little bit differently. Um, I define it with a form called define host interface expression, which says this is a form uh, that is going to sit in a racket expression context uh, and is going to be an entry point to my DSL. So then I can start writing out the syntax. Um, so the syntax for machine uh, is there's an initial state and there's uh, uh, some ID identifier, some identifier for the initial state of the machine that we want to go to. There's the keyword states. And then following that, there is uh, a sequence of state specs. And then there's the keyword shared events, and then a sequence of shared of event specs. Um, so, the other thing that's going to go in the, the host interface here is how we're going to compile that language. For now, I'm just going to say, well, that's left to be done later um, and go on to finish specifying the syntax of the language. So the next piece to specify is the state machine, uh, the state uh, syntax. So um, that has a state that has a name for the state, which for now we'll just say is an ID. Uh, and then it's going to have a series of event specs. And then an event spec. Uh, oh, sorry, I missed something on the state. It's also going to have this on enter handler. So we're going to assume that uh, every state has an on enter. Uh, and because this is sort of an on enter is sort of an auxiliary keyword of state, I have to make that explicit. And the way, to, way that I do that 
uh, is saying I'm going to match on the datum on enter. So it doesn't think it's like a pattern variable or something. All right, so that's states. And then events. Um, so that's on. Uh, we have the, uh, I guess, the name of the event, which is an ID, and potentially some arguments to the event, like the data given to that loaded event. Um, so uh, that's also an ID, sequence of those. And in the body, we might have some action that's a racket expression. And then we're going to have uh, the transition to some other state. So uh, new name, that'll be to the new name. Uh, and this is sort of an auxiliary keyword as well. So I'm going to match it as well with tilde data. So at this point, I've written down uh, the whole syntax uh, of the language. Um, and I'm just going to try copying this machine spec in here and uh, seeing, seeing if that works. Or if I've made mistakes. Ah, I have to import. Should have made this hashling racket. Okay, uh, on expected more terms. Let's see what I said on. Ah, so the way I wrote this, I uh, wrote it that there must be an action expression there. And this particular on only has a transition. It doesn't have an action expression. So the mistake that I made was forgetting to say that there can be zero or more action expressions with a dot, dot, dot there. All right, so now the syntax checks. Um, so any mistake that we make in the syntax, um, now we will get uh, we'll get an error message from the meta DSL telling us the sort of mistake that we had made. So if I made a typo there, it'll tell me the syntax that was expected in that context. Um, so at this point, we've declared the syntax. We're checking the basic syntactic structure. Um, and the next step is to uh, check binding structure. So uh, in this particular language, um, there are names of states that sort of act as bindings that are referred to in other parts of the language. So uh, here, uh, this is a reference to the state that we should uh, transition into. Uh, and we also have references to state names in these uh, transition specs here. So transition to display. So right now, if I make a mistake in one of these references, uh, I'm not going to get an error right now because we're not checking binding structure yet. So let's add rules to check binding structure so that we get that. So the first thing to do is to add a specification of a binding class. So that's just a kind of binding. And in this case, it's going to be a state name. Uh, and then we can start uh, changing occurrences of state names in the grammar instead of just being plain IDs that are unchecked. We can say, well, this name is actually a state name. Um, and this name that we transitioned to here is also a state name. And uh, in the initial state here, that's a state name. So now if we try and run this, um, we'll get a complaint that, uh, well, there's no binding for the no data state name. And that's because just by saying that we've state name, we, we're basically treating them all as references. So we haven't said which are binding occurrences and what the scoping structure of the language is like. So the next thing to do is to add in some rules for the scoping structure of the language. Um, so the way that's going to work is that a machine machine is going to create a scope. And that scope is going to contain all of the bindings for the states within. So I'm going to say I have a binding rule for machine, creates a scope. The scope is represented by these curly braces. Um, and it's going to say that, uh, that the states um, are in this scope in a recursive fashion where the bindings of states are bound in the scope, and any references inside the states are also resolved in this scope. Um, so that's what recursive S means there. So I'm referring to this pattern variable 
from the syntax specification there. And then I'm going to say that when we want to resolve the, the name of the initial state here, and when we want to look for state names that occur anywhere in an event spec, we're also going to look inside the scope. So I'm going to say init and e lie inside this scope. So then the remaining thing to do is to actually make a variable binding when we encounter a state. So I'm going to add a binding rule for state, and it's going to say that it exports the name name um, to whatever scope that it sits within. Um, so together, the export and this binding rule are going to mean that there's going to be a binding occurrence for the state name uh, within the context of the machine. Mm, all right. And I have to make one other little change here. Um, I have to say that the state specifications are a two-pass non-terminal uh, because the implementation involves first traversing them to find the bindings and then traversing them again uh, to go through the portions that can contain references. All right, so I've declared with those little rules, the binding rules for my language. So now if I make a mistake when I'm writing down a reference, uh, I'll get an error saying that it's unbound. If I get it right, it'll accept. So sort of the only remaining thing to do, we've declared the binding structure of the language. We have, um, uh, and the, the, the grammar of the language. Oh, I, I guess the last thing that I wanna show here is that uh, we also get a little bit of understanding from the IDE based on this. Um, so if I highlight a reference, it knows where the binding occurrence is. Um, and that's about the limit of the ID services that we get in Racket, um, unfortunately. And that's something I'd like to improve on. So the remaining thing to do is now that we've declared the front end of this language, now we have to compile it to an implementation. Um, that's a little bit too much to do as a live demo. So I pre-prepared a compiler backend for this that I'm going to import and use. Um, And this is a little silly that I have to restate the syntax here and passing it to the compiler. That's something I will fix. But um, so with that, now there's a backend. And when we run this, it's going to complain because it's going to start trying to um, actually compile the racket sub expressions that are part of the machine now. Um, so it's not going to work here, but. Uh, if we uh, return to our original program where it actually makes sense in context, uh, we should be able to run it. Oh, I have to comment out the old bad version of the controller uh, written at the low level. Now I use the DSL one. And I have to export the names that I defined in the language here. So that's machine and state and on. It's the syntax of the language. And my program works again using the new DSL. So just to give you a taste of what the compiler looks like, uh, it's not a complicated thing. Uh, I'm not going to go over it in any detail, but um, it's about 50 lines. Um, so there's an expansion for the top level machine. There's an expansion for states and there's an expansion for event handling. And they generate the same kind of code that you saw using the design pattern uh, at the beginning where for every state, I make a constructor function an event handler function. Uh, and for all of the events, I have a match on the different events that might be there. Um, so it's really straightforward if, if you're familiar with Racket macros at all. Um, and not too much code. So that's it as far as a demo. Um, just a couple more points I want to make on my slides and then time for questions. So 
what we got out of building a language uh, with the meta language in this way. We we're able to give some structure to our language front end. It's not a mess of procedural code. It's a declarative specification of the syntax and the binding structure of the language. And we separated out the concern of how we're going to compile that language from that front end declaration. The other thing that we achieved is that we hid all of the details of the macro system API that you would have to use if you were to implement this as a procedural macro by hand. Um, you're not having to worry about how the expansion process works. You're not having to worry about what sort of uh, data representations you're going to use at compile time to represent different kinds of bindings. All you're doing is you're writing down the grammar and the binding rules that you'd like. Uh, and our hope is that maybe we can use this to generate better IDE services. Um, so having this declarative specification means we can generate multiple things from it, not only the, um, the sort of compiler for it, but we can also potentially generate things like error recovery parsing and things like that from it. Um, and to do that, we would have to broaden the API that macros pro, uh, interact with the host language on in order for the host language and macros to communicate about IDE services. Um, and if programmers were writing those implementations, implementing that, that API to talk about ID services by hand, that would be a lot of extra work that you would have to do when implementing a new language extension. But if it's something that we can derive from a declarative specification, then there's no extra work for a language extension author, just extra work for me making the meta DSL. Um, so, Future things that we want to do, we want to be able to express more binding structures. We want to be able to express type systems, um, particularly if you're building this for a different language that was typed, like typed racket instead of plain racket. Um, we want to be able to generate those IDE services I was talking about. And also, I think it would be really interesting to try and apply this idea in other languages that have macro systems, uh, like Clojure or Rust or Julia. Um, and this would be a way to sort of bring a, a language workbench implementation, uh, at least uh, in the version that I've made, uh, out into sort of the wild of conventional language programmers. Um, so that's a direction I'm excited about. Uh, so that's it. And I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Michael, for the presentation. So if there is any question. Uh, well, I, I have one and uh, um, I've seen that at some point you were showing in the editor uh, the link between a reference and the declaration, you know, with uh, this sort of oval with the green background and the line. Yep. And it is, not clear to me if this is something that comes for free with the racket uh, editor or is that something that you added for for your specific uh... yeah so it's something that's existed uh for a while with with dr racket um and the way it works is that um you know for simple macros where the surface syntax expands down to a reference in a binding in racket code uh, and then you have source location annotations on that, then the IDE can, can understand the binding structure of the fully expanded code, use the source location annotations to map back to the surface. It gets a little bit more complicated when you have a complex macro where you actually throw away those identifiers and they aren't part of the compilation. So there's a protocol where macros can leave behind syntax properties that say, well, this was a reference or a binder in the surface and it's been, been disappeared. And that property is there in the fully expanded code for the IDE to understand. If you're writing a macro by hand, there's work by hand to do to copy along those properties to the right place. If you're using the middle language, uh, then that's something that's implemented behind your back for you. Okay, and uh, a follow-up question is regarding the Dr. Rocket editor, um, how extensible is it? I mean, could you add uh, a feature like uh, this one where you show, for example, these links graphically or, you know, uh, expand on auto-completion and things like that, or is more... Yeah. Um... I mean, it, it it takes plugins. I'm not super familiar with the editor itself. I've never worked on the editor. Uh, certainly people make extensions to it with plugins, but those are sort of 
separate, like, you know, if you wanted a plugin, you have to separately install the plugin. It's not just like importing your language, right? Which is uh, not sort of the experience that I want to have. Um, whereas, uh, like, uh, there's work on SugarJ, uh, which had this idea of, I think they called it them editor libraries, where the programs that you wrote could also have fragments in them that would extend the IDE. Uh, and that's more in the direction that I would be interested in, but also uh, hoping to build, sort of automatically generate a lot of those editor services from the declarative language spec. Good, thank you. Okay, I see a question from Peter in the chat, and is what facilities would a conventional language need to supply to support implementing this approach to DSL development? Yeah, sure. So uh, the most basic one is you have to have a procedural macro system uh, so, uh, so that you can express the complex enough code to sort of implement the, the language workbench, meta language. You also need macros to be able to generate other macros because the, the macro for the meta language is generating the macro that implements the, the object language, like the state machine language here. Um, so not, not, not all macros, procedural macro systems allow macros to generate other macros. So that's sort of an, an essential feature there. Um, and you need the, the syntax representation that the macros consume to be flexible enough to be able to represent whatever DSL syntax you want. So for example, um, you know, Scala has a macro system, but the syntax of a Scala macro has to be syntax that that parses and type checks as Scala, right? So it's really limited. You can compile that however you want afterwards, but is really limited uh, what the syntax of your language can look like if it has to parse and type check as Scala, right? Um, so Rust, for example, has uh, Rust procedural macros use a representation they call token trees. So basically the, uh, the balance delimiters in the language, like curly braces and parens, those parse into trees, but the rest of the lexer tokens are still just sort of a flat stream. And so you have a fair amount of flexibility in, um, in inventing a syntax on top of Rust's lexical syntax. Um, so that's sort of a third element. Uh, and then I guess the last thing, and this is really the most complex, is if you're building a language workbench like this, but for a typed language, you would really want the type system of your DSL to be able to interact with the type system of the host language. Um, and to do that, you would have to have a macro system API that allowed reflecting on host language types. Um, so Scala at least used to have that. They might have uh, locked that down in the more recent versions. Um, that's not something that you can do in Rust, for example, because macro expansion happens before type checking, not interleaved with type checking. Um, so to do it in a really rich, rich way, you would want those processes to be interleaved so that macros could inspect type information and also generate typed code. Okay, thanks. Okay, I also have a question. Um, so when we were uh, seeing the define hosted syntax uh, construct, I noticed that the bindings specification was mixed together with some sort, what I would say is the concrete syntax specification of the DSL. Uh, was that a um, technical decision that you made or do you plan to allow users to maybe uh, split and separate uh, binding specifications? and the concrete syntax specification? Uh, do you think that that's not necessary? Yeah, I think it's a, a design decision that depends on sort of how complex each of those pieces are. So in Racket, the concrete syntax specification is really a, a tree grammar, not uh, a context-free grammar on, on, on sequences of tokens, right? So it's relatively simpler. And the binding structure that I allow specifying in this language is sort of racket-like binding structure that is, again, relatively simple. Um, whereas if, uh, if say, you were building a meta language for a typed language where uh, type checking and binding uh, intermix in interesting ways, uh, particularly for like an object-oriented typed language, um, then uh, there's a lot of complexity there and you'd probably want to separate that out into a different specification. But uh, in Racket, since they're both relatively simple, the goal was to sort of 
um, be able to get the basic syntax of your language down as, as quickly as possible, and then just add on these extra annotations uh, without having to sort of restate the entire syntax of your language in order to do so. Um, and that seemed like the easiest way to do it for the particular domain of racket-like syntax and binding. Okay, thank you. Any other question? I have one uh, that is uh, maybe a bit uh, uh, a bit more open. Is do you think it would make any sense to be able to to import grammar's definition in common formats like E, B, and F? Like I was thinking, if I would like to embed in my language in my DSL something like. JSON or perhaps something more advanced like SQL. You know, yeah. if I could reuse some sort of existing grammar, it could save me some work, but I don't know if it's a good fit for. Yeah, I can imagine a system that is, is designed where uh, where that would make sense and where you would sort of literally use existing languages exactly as is and embed them. Um, that's sort of different from the approach that I'm following here. Uh, you know, I don't think basic, basically the idea here is to build um, sort of a family of languages with sort of similar design conventions. They're all using whatever the host language lexical syntax is at least, right? And they're using a kind of static semantics that is similar to how the host language builds its static semantics. So, you know, if I was doing this in Scala where it's bidirectional type checking, I would probably build bidirectionally typed DSLs. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think, I think my particular vision of how I would, the, the ecosystem of languages that I'd like to work with are all things built, uh, sort of on these, these common conventions so that, um, as a programmer, if I understand racket, I'm likely to understand the basic structure of a DSL fairly well. Um, but I can certainly imagine a, a different approach where, uh, you, you import languages more literally. Thank you. Okay, I will stop the recording. If uh, uh, Federica, I guess you you will have to do it.